Welcome back to a, another video feature of the Immersive Worlds Handbook. Today, I'm outside of Hochtal, Germany, at the Neanderthal Museum, taking on a tour of this interesting museum which uh, fascinates many of anthropologists. So let's go around and take a look. All right, so we'll begin the tour. I am doing some voiceover right now, some video I shot while on site. As you can imagine, it's sometimes impractical to try to do voiceovers. There are a couple of um, segments where I will um, you know, cut back to the voiceovers I did do on site, particularly the outdoor stuff. I'll take you uh, to the Discovery Center. Um, the museum is right near the grounds of where the first Neanderthal was discovered and the museum now owns that particular site. So we'll take a tour outside. We'll also um, go into the gift shop at the end and I'll focus on some highlights for me and the innovative sides of this museum. Um, after we, we kind of do the, the walkthrough. So I'll save some of that, although I may highlight some of the same issues here. Um, for me, this was you know an opportunity to come to this museum because I was in uh, Bonn, Germany, very near um, this uh, museum, about an hour away by train. And one of the things I really enjoyed, and I'll talk about this in the highlights, is this um, the sign there says a journey through time, a trip through time. I really like how they approach the conceptual organization of the museum. This was pretty cool, for example, the sands of time, and then we're going to just go around this and look at some of the early human ancestors and their significance in terms of a lineage of human um, evolution, homonym evolution, early human evolution. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of stuff happening in this museum. I think there's a lot of innovation in terms of how they've approached some of the displays. You do get the static displays like here. Um, I mentioned later in the video that I don't always enjoy in a museum just, you know, the use of mannequins and so forth, but I also understand that it's part of, I guess, the trope or um, the approach that museums often take in terms of presenting information to the public. What I think is more innovative is how they've approached some of the other displays, particularly when they're making connections between our lives in the present and the lives of Neanderthals and other hominins in the past. Because for someone who hasn't taken an archaeology class or a biophysical anthro class, you may be unable to appreciate some of the things you're seeing here and you may also have encountered Neanderthals in pop culture, in literature, in movies, um, through forms of you know misinformation. Um, so it's important here. Um, evolution uh, moves on. Uh, the sign says, and where are we going? So. Um, so Leben and uh, Überleben, uh, life and survival, um, certainly when you think about the history of Neanderthals um, and what you get in this museum and also what you get probably in the literature if, if you read about um, these ancestors of ours is just the harsh, harshness of life and the challenge of life and so forth. And I think it's one of the things they can use and they do use to leverage um, our ability to connect with what we're seeing in the museum because in a museum like this it would be so easy to just present exotic pictures and imagery of Neanderthals and sort of use the narrative of wow aren't they so different than us and our lives are so different they actually take the opposite approach here and as an anthropologist as someone who's done archaeological digs and have, have studied has studied um, these early human ancestors I have to say that it was a surprise and uh, uh, I was so pleasantly surprised to see this in the museum, the fact that they took this approach and didn't go that other route, which I think has happened um, in some natural history museums where they just show us skeletons or cranial uh, casts and say, here you go, look how different we are kind of thing. Um, this was really key, um, and I've mentioned this later in the video, but the fact that they're using this almost as a branded opportunity to connect with the guests. A lot of pictures um, were taken with this gentleman who is of course a Neanderthal but he has a business suit on. So an opportunity again to challenge our perceptions and misperceptions about our ancestors. Say, likewise here, way for the camera and uh, you can also see there's mirrors here and a little plaque focused on uh, the genetics of Neanderthals in us. If you've read um, the changing uh, perspectives on Neanderthals in the scientific literature, of course, years ago, like when I was an undergrad in, in the 19, late 80s, early 90s in anthropology, uh, the perception was that Neanderthals were different, they died out, they weren't a part of our 
um, modern species today. Now the evidence has shifted, and in fact, more um, archaeologists are saying that it's the opposite, that there is Neanderthal in us. Um, this is one of my favorite displays in the museum, and, and I mentioned this later, so I won't uh, say too much about it, but basically showing us the different eras of human history starting 10,000 years ago. And then we're going to be moving up in time here in each of these displays. What I would say um, is this is a very effective way to communicate something to the guest philosophically, conceptually. I'm focusing the camera here a little bit. There we go. Um, and it's not that expensive. And I think this could be um, a um, message or a, a technique to think about for other museums because sometimes you think like you need a lot of money you have to have all this interactivity you have to have technology you have to have all this cool stuff happening in a very flashy sense sense actually you don't and there are so many displays including this next one here I would say where they're doing some things that certainly are innovative and creative but do not require a lot of money and I think this is a message um, or a reminder for other museums out there you don't need a lot of money to do really evocative things in your museum displays it really is more at the level of art right when you think about how studio artists consider um, certain techniques to communicate with their audiences it's much the same thing going on when you are um, you know, thinking about displays in museum spaces. Um, so something I think certainly to remember. Uh, this is the section on tools and knowledge, and this is another example of some innovative, uh, innovative approaches to display. So what they have on the bottom is the um, Neanderthal version of, of tools. So it could be a particular um, pelt or hide that is used for some purpose. It could be like glue and it could be a weapon. And then they try to give you the modern version of that, the contemporary version of that on top. Again, this is not incredibly expensive to create. I mean, there's a display here, there's some signage, but the way they've done it, I think is very effective. It's evocative. It's visually interesting to look at in an aesthetic sense, but more importantly, in the sense of how it allows us to connect through analogy, the past, the stone tool here to the more contemporary version uh, with some you know a metal uh, files there at, at the bottom that you might find in any hardware store that is a really creative approach and it was uh, one of many examples you see a belt uh, a sander up there one of many examples in this museum where I was thoroughly surprised and pleasantly surprised just to see something like this um, when I visit a museum like this one of the things I'm looking for you know, like when you visit, and again, I don't know your background if you're watching and listening to this video, um, but you know, on the one hand, I'm interested in going to any museum, whether it's an art museum or a natural history museum or a cultural museum, to take it in, to take in the sites, to take in um, the information, to learn whatever it is that they're trying to teach me in that particular museum. But then, because I study these spaces, the second part of me is very curious about what is the display going to be like? How are they connecting with guests? How are they using, in this case, audiovisual techniques to teach us about stone tools combined with some traditional techniques like a mannequin, uh, diorama displays, and so forth. So for me, there's a dual purpose in visiting a museum like this. I'm interested in the information, um, in the learning side of it, as you might be. And then I'm also interested in techniques that are out there to approach connecting with guests. This is another example of that using the modern, um, sorry, using the modern uh, tool um, boxes and then um, tool chests and then putting stone tools in them. It's a very subtle thing, but I think it's a thing that really does establish our sense of commonality with Neanderthals, incorporating or allowing us to see the connections between the species and not the distance because so often in the literature and the misinformation about early humans you know it's the idea that the neanderthal is stupid is brutish and has no connection to us in, in any sense and the fact that the museum dispels many of these myths i think is so incredibly uh, commendable in terms of how they've approached things we'll look at some more um displays here so this is a um approach to uh, fire making and you can actually buy these in the gift shop which is kind of cool you'll look at um, an image of that later so a bit of an aside but years ago I had um, in one of my archaeology classes I had a student who actually did um, 
a fire making demonstration, not unlike what we see in the video here. And I think it's one of these things, I don't know, you know, if you take a survivalism class or something like this, a uh, survival class, you, you learn about some of this, but it was so hard um, to get fire, like it took, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. And the guy who did it, he was very skilled in this, in, in this technique, he had done it before. But what was really cool was just how students got to see this in a classroom setting, to see how challenging and difficult it was. And to connect it back to the Neanderthal Museum here, I think it allows you to see, if, if you think about um, fire making or other techniques, it allows you to see how challenging uh, life was for our ancestors uh, back in this era of early human history. And coming up here is a uh, little uh, couple of video screens, and um, it was kind of cool what they had playing in here. I don't know if I if I got some good. It was just with the lighting and the uh, screen. It was hard to get this, but looking at um, misconceptions of Neanderthals in the world of uh, science fiction, the past of the future. I'm always interested in this kind of focus on on temporality. By the way, it's kind of cool how they did did this display here. It almost has like a sting steampunky aesthetic, so it has that old new focus and. Uh, probably very appropriate I would say for the the loops that they were playing here on the various uh, films a lot of um, feature films again I apologize for the the quality of the the video there's an elevator there's also a burial right here so you have a Neanderthal um, burial because we're coming up on the right on the uh, section on spirituality which is a very cool one of my favorite um, sections in the museum you have a lot of flora and fauna displayed in various cases throughout the museum. By the way, as if I don't know if you can tell, you're basically going up a ramp. So it's one of these museums where you walk up um, on these ramps and you sort of move through, not really moving through time, um, but it's more moving through different themes. And I appreciated how they didn't use a strict uh, chronology in terms of approaching Neanderthals in, in this particular museum. So this is kind of cool here. This is gonna be some uh, cave painting stuff. You can see um, they're talking about sacred caves. And so I'll, um, in a second, uh, take you inside this. You basically stand under this. You stick your head uh, through these uh, partitions and I'll uh, turn up the sound here so that you can hear some of the sound and see a little bit of the video that I shot in this exhibit. Okay, so that's kind of a cool touch there. And, um, you know, I think they, they do a lot in this museum. They don't do a ton of interactivity, but they do um, a lot of things innovative in terms of how they present the material culture and how they do some of the uh, signage, the conceptual approaches to the displays. Back there is a um, actual audio um, display. You can um, listen to some uh, loops, but here's some on-site commentary at the museum. All right, so I'm just taking a, a spin around and I have to say I'm really, um, just impressed with the architecture here at the Neanderthal Museum and the level of the um, exhibitions. I've read quite a bit about just the awards that they've won and certainly you can uh, see why it's a very uh, thoughtful museum. I'm just, I started at the top and I actually ate at the uh, Neanderthal Cafe. Probably the only time you get to say that is, is eating at a Neanderthal themed cafe. Uh, indeed, there's some cave art up on the wall and that's the theming there. But you know, throughout the museum, they I think really make an effort to humanize Neanderthals. And if you've uh, studied archeology span like I have, you know that very often um, we have a perception that Neanderthals were very brutish. Um, uh, homonyms and in fact they weren't and so I think it's one of the things that uh, is important here in terms of the humanization of our early human ancestors um, and so we'll continue the tour here at the Neanderthal Museum. Okay so we're back at um, looking at some of the additional displays. This is from the um, section on religion and this was really interesting to me because Again, I think it'd be easy just to stop at that point to say Neanderthals had spirituality in, in terms of our inferences, and they, um, you know, had um, cave art and Venus figurines and so forth. But what's really cool is the fact that they extend analogies to other eras of history. They do Egypt with the pyramids, they do megaliths. They do a lot here that I think they didn't have to do. And I think it was a deliberate 
design in terms of thinking about how could they make the story of Neanderthals more present, if you will, more pertinent to our own lives. And this is the display in the world's religions talking about 5,000 years ago. Again, they don't have to do this, right? They don't have to talk about Buddhism or Hinduism, because certainly you could say, well, when I think about Neanderthals, I don't think about Hinduism or Catholicism. But the point is to make connections with us. And again, as a museum, doing this sort of thing um, is very, very innovative. And I feel like more museums need to take this approach because they get stuck in their own material. And that sounds really kind of funny and ironic, right? Well, of course, they should be stuck in their material conceptually because that's what they're doing. If they have a Neanderthal museum, they should tell us about Neanderthals. But telling that story of Neanderthals, if you take any museum studies class or you take an anthropology and material culture class, um, that is not an assumption you can ever make, right? Because every single display in the museum, every single one we're seeing here has a politics behind it, has a sense of, uh, uh, of power in terms of the design, in terms of the representational issues. If you go to um, the Museum of Jurassic Technology in Culver City, California, this is um, a point that is really brought to uh, conceptual focus at that museum because the, the whole point of the museum is to challenge our perceptions that when we go into a museum we should assume we are seeing the truth or we're hearing the truth or we're being told the truth and I think it's great to go into a museum where they're playing with our expectations and maybe um, pulling the rug um, out from under us if we have certain views about certain things. These are some of the miniatures that I thought were, were pretty interesting in terms of showing us the um, scientific side of Neanderthals, what goes on in terms of forensics, archaeology, um, paleontology, all the, the sort of um, foci that, that come up when you're um, dealing with um, early humans and doing the scientific uh, analytical side of things. Um, so yeah, in any case, I, I think it's an opportunity to use a museum like this as we, as we look a little more closely. Um, it was kind of bright, I apologize for this, it was kind of bright when I shot this the video and I wasn't doing the adjustment at the time. But um, it's really cool to see some of the things they've done at this museum because again, I think it's an opportunity to challenge our perceptions about what we um, expect to see in a museum. So it's, it's something to think about as we visit other museums in the future and as we think about our own perceptions and you know how we bring them to museums. I think if more of this is done in museums, we're going to have actually, ironically enough, a greater appreciation of the subject matter that's being dealt with in the museum. Because for me, I don't know if, if you feel this way, but if I go to a museum and the museum takes a very truth-oriented focus, this is kind of cool here, the archaeological ex ex excavation that they're showing us here. And kids, you know, you can go in and, and dig around and stuff, which is always kind of fun for little kids. Um, but, you know, for me, if I'm going to a museum and everything is explained to me and everything is laid out for me very, um, you know, logically and realistically in terms of the representation, I'm actually a little put off by this because I think that, again, the museum maybe isn't allowing us to come up with our own interpretations of what we're seeing in the museum. This is a, a, a good display here on storytelling. Um, and secondly, the museum isn't really being honest and what we call reflexive in the social sciences about the politics of representation, as I said, inherent in any given museum and in every single one of its displays. So I think it's something that you know needs to be done more in, in museums as we visit them. So for me, this will be a reminder. I'll, I'll always remember this muse, museum for some of the approaches that they took in terms of uh, thinking about museum displays in new and innovative and reflexive ways. You're getting a nice shot here of the arc architecture and the interior here as you're walking up the ramps. This gives you a bit of a perspective of what you're seeing. Okay, we'll jump ahead uh, a little bit here in the museum, and I talk about this display later, so I won't say too much now, but what I appreciated here was there was an attempt, I think, to give a more personal focus on Neanderthals by naming some of the, quote, you know, characters you might um, uh, have seen back in the day, and then also they have this human baby here, so again, trying to make a connection with us in the present. Um, I wanted to show you just a few shots of the outside just to show you um, how dramatic this museum is. You can see um, it does fit in, I think, in terms of the color scheme with the uh, surrounding environment. Um, this is one of the signs from um, 
out front um, of the museum. And here's another shot of the uh, inside again, um, just appreciating the, the architectural um, approaches on the interior. And then this is a map, actually. Um, when I arrived, I sat down at the uh, cafe, the Neanderthal Cafe. So I pulled out the map and just looked at the surrounding uh, areas. Um, I had my audio guide here, and I really wanted on this day, I was super hungry. I just walked a couple miles from my hotel. It's pretty hot, too, and I wanted a sandwich. And they only had, I just, I got there like at 2 p.m., and they only had like uh, sweets and coffee. So I had an apple strudel and a coffee, and it, it hit the spot, but it wasn't quite what I wanted. Uh, here's some of the uh, the cave art on the wall for um, the appreciation of the guest. Um, so this was kind of cool in addition to the gift shop which I'll get to at the end of the video you know it's cool to see this here the Neanderthal cafe they had some nice overlooks you could walk outside um, I'll turn up the uh, the sound here so you can you can hear some of the uh, the sound but um, you know I have to say that this was not my favorite part of the museum it seemed very like added on and maybe it's a temporary exhibit there's a few um, there's a focus here on the uh, the, the fauna the um, animals from the time of Neanderthals, but it just felt very much temporary, you know, seeing this. And I just happened to see this um, in the basement. I was looking for the um, drinking fountain, and this was um, actually in the the basement uh, near the uh, the restrooms. So it wasn't my favorite part of the museum, um, but you know, it's I guess a, a a way to extend some of the displays downstairs and uh, it definitely has a more temporary feel to it when you compare this with uh, what you see as you're walking um, upstairs. So I'll just take you through this and we'll just see what is here so you get a sense of the, the layout of the museum here in case you're curious. Okay, and in this next section of the video, I want to actually take you outside of the museum so we can see some of the uh, discovery site, and I'm sort of, in a sense, searching around trying to find the discovery site in the first part of the video, but this is uh, my on-site commentary on, my, on the day of my visit to the museum. Okay, so I couldn't resist. I have to buy the um, prehistoric Homo skull, and this one purports to be Homo neanderthalus. So that would be really cool. So we're going to see, I guess it's one of these where you can um, crack it open and find the skull on the inside. So I'm actually um, going to outside of the building. You can kind of see just how cool the structure is. Um, we're going to, let me put my skull in my pack. Sounds kind of weird. Um, we're looking for the discovery site. And uh, this is actually the site where the first Neanderthal was located. Um, and I think, let's see here. It's a pretty cool sculpture. Um, just get a sense. I gotta get some photos of the building. It's pretty sunny, but maybe it's back this way. Not entirely sure. Well, we will wander and take a look. Could this be, uh, let's see. So I have to say that it's, uh, you can see people eating up in the cafe there perhaps. I have to say it's absolutely just um, one of the coolest museums I've been to. Um, and it is literally in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it is definitely, um, if you look on the map where it is, it's um, just super, super, super remote. I'm still looking for the discovery site. Maybe it's, try this path up here. Uh, but anyway, I, uh, I stayed about an hour away, I guess by foot. I ended up walking and um, really hard to find actually, but just an amazing place when you walk through some of the terrain on these pathways, you really do get an appreciation of just how, um, hilly, you know, this environment was when Neanderthals were trekking around here. And take a look back at the building there, as you can see. Just a really marvelous um, architectural structure. 
uh, won numerous awards, as did the um, exhibits inside. This is just beautiful. I mean, just look at this, how amazing this is. Just absolutely, absolutely beautiful. Still looking for the uh, discovery site. Might have to pull out if my map has it. But, um, you know, I have to say definitely this museum um, hits a lot of, uh, or checks a lot of boxes for me. You know, I think a lot of people coming here would probably, I mean, I don't know, they might not necessarily dig the Neanderthal Museum, you know, for the reason that it has a sort of nerdy intellectual side to it, um, just in terms of the subject matter. It's brilliant, because I've mentioned in this video that you know, any student in archaeology knows that one of the things that happens in studying homonyms or early, our early human ancestors is the notion of the brutishness of um, our ancestors. A lot of the early depictions of Neanderthals had, you know, with them implicit biases. Biases suggesting that, <coughs> biases suggesting that, you know, um, Neanderthals were stupid and so forth and so it's I think a great job here pedagogically what they've done in this museum now I will say it's really small and so it's one of these things I think you have to be really intrigued with the subject matter to make the trek here because it is definitely off the beaten path it's hard to get to via bus um, the nearest um, S-Bahn station is probably half an hour away but um, definitely well worth your visit if you make it out here to this part of Germany all right, at long last, I think I found the site. I um, didn't realize how far Nantar Meters is. It's a little bit of, walk, of a walk from the museum. And uh, so this has, you know, I have to say, oh, almost missed that there on the ground. This has, you know, almost a like a sacred uh, quality to it when you think about ancestors. Um, I'm just checking out the ground here. the first Neanderthal uh, discovery. I guess I read that the site was um, perhaps damaged from um, excavations. Um, and this has, you know, kind of going along with the museum, right? This has some information about uh, Neanderthals. And so, um, you know, in a sense, right, it's an extension of the museum, but I guess this would be the uh, free part since you don't have to necessarily pay to um, to see this. So, yeah, I mean, so, so pretty cool. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I think this museum has an appeal to certain people, right? I mean, it's not going to be everyone's museum, but that's one of the reasons I think it's so fascinating. I mean, the specificity of it you know the fact that it is focused on neanderthals and obviously it has that sort of labor of love quality to it there's a foundation that basically runs a museum so it's one of these things i think because it has such a specific focus and the demographic i would imagine of folks who would come to visit the neanderthal museum is also quite specific um you know they're not going to necessarily have the ability to attract um, you know, hundreds of thousands of tourists a year. But um, I, I think it's absolutely fascinating in the sense that, you know, you have a museum that has such a specific focus and probably attracts uh, people who have um, unique interests uh, to, to go along with, with the focus here at the museum. Okay, we'll leave the uh, outdoors on the tour, and I would like to focus in this last part of the video on some highlights from my trip to the Neanderthal Museum. Um, what I really uh, enjoyed about it. One was this uh, philosophical focus, and I think you see this with some of the signage and some of the approaches that they took to the displays. I feel like they were trying to do more than just simply present Neanderthals, present these early human ancestors of ours. They were trying to create connections between um, Homo sapiens, ourselves, the visitors, and um, these early humans. And so for me, that was a, a definite highlight of the museum. And related to that is what could be called the thematics of the museum. Of course, every museum organizes and orients the guest 
um, and in, in some unique and different ways. In this particular case, I feel like as you look here, a trip through time, the signage says they really did a great job of using signage and different, almost like portals and displays to create this journey. It's not necessarily a historical one. It doesn't follow a strict chronology, and I appreciated that, but it takes you through key thematics. So in here, communication and Gesellschaft, uh, communication and society. One of the best ones in this respect was religion, and I was actually quite shocked to see the level of presentation. Just next to this is a small cave art interactive um, media display. But the fact that they created this sense of analogy with contemporary religion I thought was truly marvelous and something I hadn't expected to see at this museum. Another, I think, key approach here is maybe what could be called personalization or if I uh, hazard a, a word that doesn't exist, Neanderthalization, um, as difficult that, as it is to say. What I'm trying to suggest here is that there are a lot of misperceptions about Neanderthals and so they personalize things. They make these connections between Neanderthal children and human homo sapien children. They name some of the individuals. I'll show you in a little bit this interactive uh, display that is is part of the personalization. The, the use of mirrors here creating these suggestions that actually we are part of the Neanderthal lineage, talking about the genetic information here. So this was really key because I think these misperceptions would lead people to have um, misunderstandings before visiting this museum, uh, and perhaps they do. Here's an example just from the um, uh, near the gift shop um, of, again, that process of trying to make our connections to Neanderthals. This was one of the best um, opportunities, and I saw many, many, many people like this gentleman here taking photos of a Neanderthal in a business suit. I mean, this is a really evocative way to create that connection, to really personalize, to connect us to Neanderthals. And I saw so many people online, by the way, on social media, taking photos with the Neanderthal. I think it's one of the best um, displays I've seen in the museum that accomplishes so many different things in terms of uh, giving us a connection and really giving us a, a different sensibility about who Neanderthals were. Um, and you see a little bit here from the um, gift shop below, you just get that perspective of the architecture uh, while you're inside the museum. And I should say the architecture itself and the layout of the museum is another, I think, highlight for me. Here's that interactive uh, display I was mentioning. This is another way to increase the guest uh, connection with some of the uh, information being presented. So basically you could go through this and um, make some choices. And so it, it gives you a sense, you know, um, where would you like to, what would you like to um, eat? Um, um, gives you some choices about um, things in the lives, you know, um, aspects of the lives of Neanderthals, and then you get to, uh, at the end, get a personalized uh, profile. So using the interactive uh, components in a museum like this, I think uh, it, it's a key way of connecting with the guest. This next slide, by the way, I just thought it was kind of funny as I was trying to connect to the Wi-Fi. The, um, I couldn't actually get the thing to work on my phone for whatever reason, but I just love seeing Neanderthal Wi-Fi. I just think that's wonderful. Here's another example. It says you can scan this and read the book online, so you could just take the QR code and read it online. Um, I would say there's not a lot of interactivity in the museum, but enough probably to get the job done. The next area of highlight for me is a um, the use of what I call analogy, and this is a display of Neanderthal tool, tools and devices below, and above are the um, modern day equivalents. And to me, this was a wonderful way of establishing um, analogical thinking, basically a thing from the past, a thing from the present, and then giving the guest a sense of perspective by making this connection. Another example of that was here with these toolboxes, modern toolboxes, but inside you have um, stone tools from the era of Neanderthals. So for me, a great opportunity. Even this is kind of cool seeing, I don't know, this display of um, stone tool napping and then seeing the um, seeing it on the, the TV set. Another example of that was with violence to try to uh, get us to again make a connection between ourselves in the present and Neanderthals in the past. Um, I actually didn't notice this when I took the picture but it's the uh, World Trade Center, the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Of so to me there were many examples of analogy in the museum that 
I think established really the significance of Neanderthals beyond themselves, if that is even possible. And that was one of the greatest surprises for me uh, in visiting this museum. I didn't expect to see it. Um, this is another display just getting us to, to think about a perspective on time. And it's basically sand um, that's falling. So it, I think it gives us a um, uh, an image, if you will, a symbol, and then that allows us to walk through this this timeline that follows it. So a lot of great examples um, in this museum of thinking about museum display in entirely new and innovative ways. It's, it, it was such a nice um, opportunity to, to look at some new techniques. Um, another one of those is the use of miniatures, and these are pretty common in a lot of museums. You've probably seen these. And for me, these were, were more exciting than, say, seeing these. I, I don't know, these just didn't do much for me. I think it's obligatory that you have to have the human size mock-ups, the mannequins and so forth. But for me, these were much cooler. So this was quite innovative here. You have basically different eras of human population. This is actually the present, but it starts off in the past. So 10,000 years ago, giving us a real sense on population change. And again, getting us to think about our own conditions in the present. Um, I think this is could could be a really cool goal of more museums. Maybe you don't expect to see this in the Neanderthal Museum, seeing images of 9-11, seeing the focus on contemporary religions, or in this case, seeing a focus on overpopulation and maybe getting us to think about some opportunities for change. This particular exhibit reminded me of Pavilion Zero at the um, World Expo in Milan in, in 2015. It just had a lot of similarities in terms of using some evocative displays to get us to think about changing ourselves and changing our approaches to the world. Um, this is maybe a little less philosophical. These are just some um, opportunities for guests to look at the work of archaeologists and other scientists working in laboratory settings. This one is really cool. They have this miniature display of a hillside in the Neander Valley and then below it you have archaeologists working on excavation techniques and you can see to the left there at the bottom just just how this works. Very 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 cool um, in terms of the use of miniatures. Now here's something entirely different and random. Um, I was going through the museum thinking to myself um, you know how innovative the museum is and how interesting it is and it focuses on evolution so the question I thought I would pose is if I could um, pose a, a cage match between the Neanderthal Museum and another museum which one would it be and it would actually be if you know this the Creation Museum in Kentucky um, and I thought of this because to me they are so different you know they both deal with aspects of human evolution but if you've been to the Creation Museum or if you've seen my video I've done on it or some of my writing in attractions management, you know that they couldn't be more different museums in terms of their approaches, in terms of their philosophical considerations. Indeed, some people would say the Creation Museum isn't even a museum, but I don't know if we're going to uh, engage with, with that issue today. But I wanted to throw that as a, as a bit of an aside uh, for you today. Um, we have to end, though, with the gift shop. and. Um, for me, gift shops are just part of the museum experience, right? You go to the Louvre and it's actually like, in some cases, the, the gift shop can, can rival or the multiple gift shops can rival the museum displays themselves. Um, so I'll just show you a series of these because I think they're fascinating. Um, and for me, again, a little bit of my, my biography, you know, since I've studied early humans in my archaeology classes, um, you know, it was exciting to come to this museum. It had always been on my map. And uh, I, I just really needed the opportunity. And since I was meeting um, for a theme park studies conference in Bonn, it was a, a great opportunity to take a bit of a diversion and to um, uh, make the trek out to the muse museum. And I certainly wasn't disappointed, as I've expressed. Here's the um, early human skulls. They also had some stone tools. I, I should have picked up a few more of these, but you know, sometimes you don't want to bring a lot back with you when you're traveling uh, internationally. But just really cool i think there's something fun about this gift shop you know there's there's something it, you know humorous about seeing some of these objects as you're going to see in a second and i think playing off of humor in a museum setting isn't a bad idea i think sometimes museums can be too over the top and too sobering now of course it kind of depends on on the subject matter if it's a museum dealing with eras of dark history you wouldn't want to do something like this and you wouldn't necessarily have a gift shop that has these kinds of items that have a more humorous or even kitschier campy focus but of course in a in a neanderthal museum 
as we're viewing today, there are opportunities out there for us to, uh, you know, maybe play with things in, in a more humorous sense and to really, um, you know, wink at the guest a little bit in, in some respects. And even here, seeing the Neanderthal Euros, I was kind of surprised to see this. Um, I just didn't expect to see the level of um, items in, in this gift shop. And, and so for me, you know, going through the museum today, as I've talked about in this last section on highlights, there were just so many things that were innovative. There were so many things that certainly connected to my background and my background in archaeology and biophysical anthropology, both as a student and as an instructor of some of those classes. I've certainly taught uh, Neanderthals in terms of um, some of the case studies. I love this paleo diet stuff. Um, just an, you know, for me, another humorous side of this, the um, Neanderthal ale, I guess it is here, a, another example of something that's, that's quite... Um, surprising to see maybe at a museum like this. But again, for me, there were just so many things that came together in this museum um, in terms of the innovation, in terms of the approach to telling the story of Neanderthals, some of the humor, some of the surprises. I love seeing the Neanderthal fridge magnets. Again, from a branding perspective, using this iconic fellow um, who is, you know, in the middle of the museum, I think is, is another way to really um, market the museum and to think about things. Um, as I've mentioned in this video, you know, it's it's a small museum. It's a museum maybe that doesn't um, attract as many tourists as other museums in Germany, but I think it's one you absolutely do have to visit. Even if you're not interested in Neanderthals, I think it's it's worth uh, a day trip for you to uh, come out to the Neanderthal Museum. Um, it's a little bit off, um, you know, out of the way, but as I mentioned, there are some wonderful hikes that you can take, and I didn't show you a lot of this, but around the museum, beyond the Discovery Center, there are pathways where you can sort of trek around and do a bit of a nature tour as well. So um, a lot of opportunities, I think, to learn about Neanderthals here at the Neanderthal Museum uh, outside of uh, Aircroft, uh, Germany. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this video feature today looking at this fascinating museum, a museum that surprised me and hopefully some of the sites that I showed you today um, had that similar effect on you. So please come back for additional video features of the Immersive World's Handbook.